How do we interpret the world around us? Do we really trust what we see? In this series, experience visual and audio illusions, sensory puzzles, and brain tricks from the worlds of art, science, nature, and psychology, and learn why they baffle our senses. Let's explore how our mind works. Rough, soft, smooth, cold, or warm. We encounter so many different textures and sensations on a daily basis. Our sense of touch is able to recognize a lot of things, even when we don't use our eyes. But how does touch connect to our brain? Based on research in neuroscience, the impact of touch on the brain can be traced in a functional MRI or fMRI. Activity in different areas is measured by the increase in blood flow correlated with increase in neuronal activity. fMRI studies show that touch has a wide impact on the brain. It influences our sensations, movements, and thought processes, as well as our ability to learn new movements. Touch affects various brain regions at both conscious and unconscious levels. This is important because we usually have to depend on vocal responses to know the impact of touch. There's an area on the surface of the brain known as the somatosensory cortex. This is the brain's map of the body. Touch can trigger activity in this area. When you encounter touch, receptors in the skin or the muscles transmit a signal through the spinal cord and medulla to the specific area in your brain. Further research shows that another part of the brain that is active in learning and establishing new motor patterns is also affected by touch. This is the basal ganglia. It is also implicated in some motor disorders such as Parkinson's disease and obsessive compulsive disorder. Studies show that touch has shown a positive impact on emotions. According to one study, a group of women were told they were going to receive a shock. The effect of them holding hands with their husbands and by a technician was measured. In both cases, the effect of the touch was that it decreased the threat response that usually registers in the limbic system, which is the part of the brain associated with emotion. When somebody touches us, there is a pressure pushing on the skin at the point of contact. Under the skin, there are pressure receptors called pacinian corpuscles. When they receive pressure stimulation, they send signals to a nerve bundle in the brain called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve slows down the heart rate and decreases blood pressure. As a result, you will feel less stressed. In addition to feeling calm and reducing stress, a friendly touch can also release the hormone oxytocin, a neuropeptide that promotes feelings of devotion, trust, and bonding. The next time you give or receive the slightest friendly touch, remember the positive impact it has. So, a hug a friendly grasp of the hand, or even a pat on the back can do more wonders than you think. Fact: Babies lose half their neurons before they are born. This process is called pruning. Illusions show us errors in perceptions. There are optical illusions, but some depend on our sense of touch. These are called tactile illusions. Our sense of touch has five mechanisms that register pain, heat, cold, pressure, and physical contact with an object at the most basic level. Sometimes, though, we can also be fooled. For example, one of the oldest tactile illusions is called the Aristotle illusion. Aristotle's illusion is a tactile illusion that happens when a test person holds an object between the crossed index finger and middle finger. Without visual feedback, the person tries to determine the number of objects held. Here's how you can try the Aristotle illusion. Cross your fingers, then touch a small spherical object like a dried pea. It will feel like you are touching two peas. This will also work if you touch your nose. This shows something called perceptual disjunction. This happens because your brain was not able to take into account that you have crossed your fingers. Since the pea or nose touches only the outside of both fingers at the same time, 
your brain interprets it as two separate objects. Because of the perceptual system's inability to detect the relative position of the fingers, the single object usually gets interpreted as two objects. You can do a similar effect by holding your hands in front of you with palms down. Close your eyes and get someone to lightly tap the back of both hands once, one after the other, with as short an interval as possible in between each tap. Then, open your eyes and wave the hand that was tapped first. You'll find out you will get it right every time. Now, try it again with crossed arms. If the taps are close together, like less than 300 milliseconds, you will get it wrong most of the time. According to neuroscientists, it might be a result of your brain trying to do too many things at once. This illusion can also be done using sticks. Hold two wooden spoons out in front of you, one in each hand. With arms uncrossed, get somebody to tap the ends of the spoon in quick succession. Here, you will automatically know which stick was tapped first. But if you cross the spoons over, not your arms, you will get it wrong. Another weird thing is, if you cross your arms and the spoons, the two crossings over cancel each other out, and you will easily know which one was tapped first. All these tricks seem fairly simple, but they reflect a complex interaction of nerves. Fact, the human cerebellum, or little brain, weighs about 150 grams. What's your shoe size? How much do you weigh? What do you consider heavy or light, big or small? Can size and weight also be difficult to determine, especially when there's such a thing called the size-weight illusion? The size-weight illusion is also known as the Charpentier illusion, named after a French physician named Augustine Charpentier. He was the first to demonstrate the illusion in an experiment the illusion happens when a person underestimates the weight of a larger object when compared to a smaller object containing the same mass. This illusion also happens in difference in material and color. For instance, metal containers can seem lighter than wooden containers of the same size and mass. Also, darker objects feel lighter compared to brighter objects of the same size and mass. In other words, illusions can be described as contrast with an object's expected weight. Expected weight or density can be measured using matching visible or hidden weights lifted in the same manner. One of the early explanations for these illusions was that people usually judge an object's weight through its appearance. Then, they lift it with a predetermined force. If they think that a large object is heavier, they use greater force in lifting it. This was proven in an experiment where two objects of the same mass, same cross-section, but different height were placed on subjects' supported hands, and it produced a passive size-weight illusion. Studies have also shown that the lifting force quickly adapts to the true mass of the objects, like we adjust our force when we realize it's lighter or heavier. But the size-weight illusion still remains. This illusion cannot be attributed to the manner of lifting, so it is probably due to perceptual rescaling based on our initial expectations. The rescaling in this case is considered suboptimal, so the central nervous system integrates prior expectations with the current proprioceptive information. It emphasizes information that is not expected instead of taking an average of all the information. Contrast effects are connected to efficient neural coding. If the selected range is too high or low in terms of size-weight illusion, there is both a contrast illusion and a loss of discrimination. Weight discrimination lessens when objects are heavier or lighter than their expected density. Objects like this can account for perceptual rescaling without the need to consider the manner of lifting. It seems our perception of how light or heavy an object is cannot always be relied on. It's always better to check the scale to be sure. Fact. You have taste receptors in the stomach, pancreas, intestines, lungs, and the brain. Say what now?
You would say it is easy to tell whether something is hot or cold, right? Fire is hot, ice is cold, the sun's rays are hot, snow is cold. Different kinds of nerve cells or receptors called thermoreceptors are specialized neurons that are sensitive to the changes in temperature. They detect shifts in temperature within a normal range, while nociceptors are what detect temperatures that could be dangerous to the body. In the skin, thermoreceptors send information to our brain about the temperature in our environment. Usually, this is important because it will let the body know if there is an unusually cool or warm temperature that might prompt you to put a warm jacket or remove a layer of clothing to be more comfortable. These neurons also give more general information about a body's environment, so it can help you find which part of the room is cooler or warmer. When a temperature seems to become dangerous, this will be detected by nociceptors, which are neurons sensitive to pain. They tell the body whether something is freezing or burning because a quick response is necessary. For example, if you burn your hand on a pan, nociceptors alert the body to say it has been burned and to alert the brain that cells on the hand have been damaged by the heat, so the pan needs to be dropped immediately. Sometimes, though, your brain gets fooled into detecting whether something is hot or cold. A neuroscientist named Frederick Lindstedt made an experiment one day on a pack of frankfurters. He put half of the pack in the microwave and the rest in the fridge. Then he arranged them in a warm, cool, warm, cool pattern on his countertop and placed his hand on them. What he felt was an unpleasant burning sensation. This trick is called the thermal grill illusion. If one feels harmless levels of cold and warm sensations at the same time, in a grill-like pattern, it can hurt. Researchers made a plastic box with one surface covered with bars made of silver, which is not magnetic. They strapped the box to the subject's leg, then heated or cooled the silver bars by pumping hot or cold water inside the box to change the silver's temperature. Every 20 seconds, they warmed all the bars to 41 degrees Celsius and cooled all the bars to 18 degrees Celsius. Then they alternately warmed and cooled the bars to create the illusion. Results of the fMRI showed that those who experienced the illusion had a responding thalamus, which is the relay station in the brain where sensory impulses pass. Part of the pain matrix, which was a collection of brain regions that managed pain, became active. Fact: Scratching our injuries causes a release of endorphins to block the pain of the initial injury more effectively. How well do you know your own body? Would you notice if a part of you went missing? That might sound like a silly question, but the answer isn't as obvious as you think. There is an illusion called phantom limb which is the sensation that a missing limb or organ is still attached to the body and moving normally with other body parts. This can happen to people whose limbs have been amputated or whose body parts and organs may have been removed. While not all phantom limbs are painful, some patients who suffer from it feel like they are gesturing or feel an itch or even try to pick things up with their limb that is not there. The phantom limb syndrome shows that we don't always perceive reality as it really is. Sometimes we perceive a reality constructed by our minds. They are a mystery if we consider that the body sends sensory images to a passively receiving brain. Instead, we should consider that the brain generates that experience of the body. The sensory inputs we receive just modulate the experience, not cause it. To find out what this feels like, you can try something called the phantom limb illusion. A participant will sit on a table with their forearm and hand resting on a table. Put a fake rubber arm next to the person's arm. A towel will cover their shoulder to the forearm of both the fake and real arms, so the participant's mind will not tell which of the two arms is the real one. Then. The two arms, the real and the fake one, are simultaneously stroked. In less than a minute, the participant will feel that they have two right arms. 
Our brain constantly tries to figure out where our body is. It does so by combining the information from position, touch, and signals from the muscles and tendons in our arm. A map of the body is developed by the brain to keep track of where our limbs are and what they are doing for different reasons. To keep us from harm, enable movement, and provide a sense of bodily self. In the phantom limb illusion, we use a brain area that is designated for our right arm, so its attention is divided. The things our limbs experience are not just located on the limbs. They are also found in the brain map, so people can experience a stimulation of the limb just by stimulating the brain. This body map is what is responsible for the phantom limb illusion. So now that you've learned this, can you say you can tell if a part of you is missing or not? Would you pass or fail the phantom limb illusion test? Sometimes we think we are extremely familiar and at home with our bodies. But the surprising thing is, our brain can fool us into thinking otherwise. In fact, there is no sense of pain within the brain itself. This lets neurosurgeons probe areas of the brain even while the patient is awake. Movement is a part of our everyday lives. Well, unless you're too lazy to get up, that is. However, there is a sensation of motion or spinning that is also described as dizziness. This is called vertigo. People who experience vertigo feel like they are spinning or moving or that the world around them is spinning. Vertigo actually happens when there is a conflict between the signals sent to the brain by different balance and positioning sensing systems of the body. To better understand this, let's first learn the different parts of our body that affect movement and perception of movement. The brain makes use of the input from four sensory systems to maintain a sense of balance and orientation to our surroundings. Our vision gives us information on the position and motion in relationship to the rest of the world. So this is essential to maintaining balance. The sensory nerves in our joints let the brain keep track of the position of our legs, arms, and torso. Our body is able to automatically make small changes in our posture to keep us balanced. Our skin pressure sensation also gives us information about our body position and motion in relation to gravity. There's also a portion in our inner ear called the labyrinth that includes semicircular canals containing specialized cells that detect motion and changes in position. When there's injury or diseases in our inner ear, it can send false signals to the brain. When these false signals conflict with signals from the other parts of our body that are connected with other balance and positioning parts of our body, vertigo can happen. The main symptom is a sensation that you or the room is moving or spinning when neither one is actually occurring. Other symptoms of vertigo are having trouble focusing the eyes, dizziness, hearing loss in one ear, loss of balance, and a rigging sound in the ears. On top of that, you will also experience difficulty in swallowing, double vision, eye movement problems, facial paralysis, slurred speech, and weakness of the limbs. Vertigo is a serious disorder, so if you know anyone who might have it, tell them to see a doctor right away. There are certain medications to help patients handle it better. If you see anyone who is experiencing it, tell them to keep still and sit or lie down when their symptoms occur. They should also try to resume their activities gradually and avoid sudden changes in position. The next time you feel movement, Pause and concentrate and check if the movement is real or all in your head. It's always better to be safe than sorry. Fact, our working memory or short-term memory can store on average a maximum of seven digits. We're aware that each of our senses has a specific purpose. Our eyes to see, our nose to smell, our skin to touch, and so on. However, each of the senses also has the ability to influence information processing in the other senses. So don't think they're limited to just one purpose. 
Multisensory integration is the study of how different senses are integrated by the nervous system. This includes our sense of sight, sound, touch, smell, self-motion, and taste. Multisensory integration is essential to our adaptive behaviors because it lets us perceive a world of coherent perceptual entities. It also deals with how our different senses interact with each other and affect each other's processing. For example, when we hear a car's honking sound, we would assume that the car making that sound would be the car that is spatially closest to the honk. This is a case of combining visual and auditory stimuli. On the other hand, sound and images on a TV show would be integrated as a structural congruent by combining visual and auditory stimuli. However, if the audio and video did not fit meaningfully, we would segregate the two stimuli. Research shows that our visual modality is usually more biased than our other senses. Based on one experiment studying the varying degree of spatial congruency, vision overpowers whatever we hear. This behavior is also called the ventriloquist effect. A study by Welch and Warren in 1980 showed that multisensory processes followed a visual dominance of spatial tasks or visual capture, showing that we will usually depend on vision over our senses of hearing and touch to solve spatial problems. So auditory stimuli cannot influence our perception of the location of a stimulus. Instead, audition was considered dominant in temporal tasks. Another theory is the Bayesian integration, which says our brain has to deal with a number of inputs. When we deal with these inputs, they should come up with a coherent representation of the world corresponding to reality. While these different theories have many possible realities, it is more likely that multisensory integration will depend on the individual and the stimuli it is exposed to. We are all unique and so are our senses, and they all work together uniquely to benefit us. The fact that our senses can automatically work together with each other shows how amazing our entire system is. Don't you agree? Our sense of touch is one of the most amazing things we possess. Discovering several textures and temperatures can heighten our experience and also help us in more ways than we can imagine. We can feel comfort, relaxation, and even overall happiness. The interesting thing is, our brain just has as much to do with our sense of touch as our skin. Even if our brain is tucked inside our skull, and does not encounter any external stimuli directly. It has a say in how we respond to how all our senses react, actually. So keep using all of your senses and keep your mind open.